minutes to connect to the audio. While we're waiting, I'm also going to just share my screen very briefly because we do have live interpretation for today's discussion. And we wanna make sure that everyone who wants to listen in Vietnamese is able, uh, is able to do so. So all of you hopefully will see up on screen uh, both English and Vietnamese instructions on how to get into the translation room. Uh, in just a moment after these instructions are repeated in Vietnamese, uh, we're going to open the interpretation. And when that happens, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little globe image um, that, that's labeled as interpretation. When you click on that, it will give you the option to go into a Vietnamese interpretation room. So we would recommend um, that everyone who wants to listen in, in Vietnamese, please go ahead and join that translation room. So Viet, if you could interpret that into Vietnamese, then once you're done, we can get the interpretation started. Yes. Xin chào tất cả quý vị, các anh các chị. Chào buổi sáng từ phía Mỹ hoặc là chào buổi tối từ phía Việt Nam. À, rất là vui được à, chào đón mọi người tới phiên tọa đàm ngày hôm nay. À, trong khi mọi người đang ở trong phòng chờ để mà tham dự phòng học lớn, thế thì tôi xin phổ biến một số những cái thông tin để chúng ta có thể tham dự thuận lợi. À, ở đây thì à, ngôn ngữ chính là bằng tiếng Anh, nhưng mà chúng ta à, chúng ta cung cấp à, dịch vụ phiên dịch à, sang tiếng Việt. À, thì trong à, khi giới thiệu à, ban đầu thì chúng tôi sẽ hướng dẫn sơ qua mọi người và có màn hình ở trên để mọi người theo dõi về cách nhấp vào các biểu tượng phóng to thu nhỏ và chọn các kênh ngôn ngữ ở đây bấm vào cái chức năng phiên dịch thì mọi người sẽ thấy hiện ra biểu tượng quả địa cầu và đó có ngôn ngữ tiếng việt để mọi người chọn tôi xin đề nghị mọi người có thể là sử dụng cái ngôn ngữ tiếng việt nếu mình không nghe được trực tiếp tiếng anh và sau khi phổ biến xong phần này thì chúng tôi sẽ bật chức năng dịch song song để mà mọi người có thể được lắng nghe dịch song song để tiết kiệm thời gian All right, thank you, Viet. So Adrian, if we can turn on the interpretation, then I think we'll be good to go. So with that, I'll leave the screen up for just a couple seconds more. And then Brian, uh, if you want to go ahead and start opening remarks, I'll take the screen down as soon as you start talking. Well, welcome everybody to this exciting event. It's, it's a real pleasure to invite you all into this multilingual virtual event where we are going to celebrate the authorship and, and the, the launch of Ambassador Ted Osius's book, Nothing is Impossible, which is a memoir, a personal memoir of Ambassador Osius's personal journey through the reestablishment and the strengthening and, and now the very tight friendship that exists between the United States and Vietnam. My name is Brian Eiler. I am the director of the Stimson Center Southeast Asia program, which focuses a lot of its work on the Mekong region and the Mekong issue, as well as uh, I am also the chair of our War Legacies Working Group. And uh, so today's event uh, is going to focus on those two issues. Uh, I think some of you or many of you might have attended Ambassador Osius's previous talks, which give a general overview of, of his book. Uh, I think we will hear that today, but we've asked uh, Ambassador Osius and our facilitator, Tao Nguyen Griffiths, to focus a bit on Mekong issues and war legacies. Uh, so we're going to hear a little bit of a different message uh, from Ambassador Osius today, and I really look forward to that. Before I get to introductions, I do want to say that we're proud as part of Stimson's commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion to have a personal commitment from our program to when appropriate and when we can provide simultaneous interpretation for all of our virtual and in-person events. And uh, so we've invited a, a good friend, um, Mr. We've yet from Ho Chi Minh City to provide translation today. And again, if you are interested in uh, listening to this um, event in Vietnamese language, please choose the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen and, and choose the Tiang Viet option to hear the event in Vietnamese language. So one other housekeeping note is if you have a question for Ambassador Osius um, or Tao, 
um, you can write that question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, that is where you will have an opportunity to ask a question. And Courtney, uh, my uh, good colleague, will be uh, looking at those questions and asking questions to, um, to our speakers today. So without any further ado, let me introduce our speakers. And I'm going to bring up our introductions and bio. So uh, today our facilitator is Ms. Tao Griffiths, who grew up in Ha Zhang, Vietnam, which is in the Mekong. I'm really happy to uh, have a fellow Mekonger here um, in the room. And she's worked for many years on issues related to war legacies and economic developments in Vietnam. She currently serves as a policy advisor to the chairman of Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And from 2006 to 2016, she served as country director for Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, which worked tirelessly to ban landmines. So very appropriately, Tao is really well equipped to kind of home in on our War Legacies discussion today. She was the first Vietnamese citizen to serve as country director and work to raise awareness of war legacy issues and bring in funding to address Agent Orange. She has also worked as an advisor for a range of companies in Vietnam, worked as a local expert for the United Nations Development Program and served as a Fulbright Scholar. She holds a master's in systems engineering and a master's in international relations and also studied at the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, a good partner of the Stimson Center. And our author and, and key speaker today is uh, former ambassador Ted Osius, who is now the president and CEO of US ASEAN Business Council here in Washington, DC. And it's a pleasure to have Ambassador Osius back in Washington. He's also the author of Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam. A diplomat for 30 years, Ambassador Osia served from 2014 to 2017 as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam. In October 2021, Ambassador Osia published Nothing is Impossible, covering the two countries' 25-year journey from adversaries to friends and partners. And after his departure from government, Ambassador Osia joined Google Asia Pacific as Vice President for Government Affairs and Public Policy, covering 19 Asian nations from Google Singapore headquarters. Earlier, he was senior advisor at Albright Stonebridge Group and the first vice president of Fulbright University of Vietnam. Ambassador Osius was associate professor at the National War College and senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He was the first U.S. ambassador to receive the Order of Friendship from the president of Vietnam, and he serves on the Asia Foundation's Board of Trustees and numerous advisory boards. Ambassador Osius speaks Vietnamese, French, and Italian, and a bit of Japanese, Indonesian, Hindi, Thai, Tagalog, and Greek. Uh, Greek. <laughs> um, uh, that would be great, Ambassador Osi, if you spoke Creek, uh, Native American. Uh, he and his husband, Clayton Bond, have a seven-year-old son and a six-year-old daughter. And just one other plug about Ambassador Osius's um, very storied legacy is that he also served as regional environmental officer uh, in Bangkok and covered the Mekong issue about 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, both Ted and Tao are good friends uh, to me and good friends to the Simpson Center. It's just a real pleasure to have you all here. I'm gonna turn this over to Tao to facilitate our fireside chat with Ambassador Osius. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. And um, thank you the Stimson Center for this um, honor and pleasure to moderate a conversation with our dear friend, Ted Osius. So, but first and foremost, uh, allow me to correct the title, uh, which you previously mentioned that I serve as the policy advisor to the chair of the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, it was correct when you reached out to me, uh, but uh, I have just uh, completed my work at the chamber uh, after almost four and a half years, and I'm about to start a new journey, uh, which starts in, uh, on, on Monday next week and in Singapore. So today is also my last day in Vietnam, last event related to this in my uh, private capacity. So Ted Osius, um, as I look into the book, I read the book, I can, I'm, I'm very moved. And um, I have a vivid memory of um, your time in Vietnam, particularly in your second time in Vietnam as ambassador. Uh, and that scattered through all 14 chapters of the book, I see myself being either part of it or witnessing some of it or heard about it. So without further ado, I think we're going to 
dive right into chapter number five, which focus on world legacy issues. And within this world legacy umbrella, we're gonna talk about, uh, I hope you agree with me on Agent Orange specifically, and the challenges of the Mekong River. As a matter of fact, the world legacy issues, you know, it, it covers more than just Agent Orange. It includes the American, fighting Americans MIA, um, collaboration on removing landmines and unexploded bombs, Agent Orange and Dioxin. And recently we got the new program that the US helped Vietnam to identify Vietnamese MIA, you know, missing in, in, in person and killing in action. Um, so the, the topics are a lot more than one, but for the purpose of this book and for the constraint of time, we're gonna focus on Asian Orange. And let's start with that. And without further ado, I want to quote uh, on page 75, Tim Rizzer, who served as the foreign policy advisor to President Pro Tempo of the US Senate, Senator Leahy. He's quoted as saying, together we overcame initial reluctance, resistance, and antagonism. It was a function of personal engagement. I assume that Tim Risa said this back in 2006, December, when he came to Vietnam together with the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation delegation led by Bobby Muller and John Tozano. So I want to focus on that personal engagement. So I would like to ask you, Ted, to tell some of the stories of how personal engagement took place over many decades in order to push the agenda of Agent Orange from both Vietnam and the US. And these heroes are all um, told in chapter five and other chapters as well. So over to you, Ted. Thank you, Tao. Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, Brian and Courtney and other friends from the Stimson Center for, for hosting this discussion. I'm really, really pleased uh, to have this opportunity to talk, with, to talk with really good friends and people I admire a lot. So thank you for uh, framing it the way you did. I, I look at these stories of reconciliation as stories about people, and particularly people who took risks to, to bring our countries from an adversarial position to becoming friends and really good friends. And I just don't think any of that happens by accident. I think it's because people decide they're gonna make the effort to make something miraculous happen. And in this case, I think it, it's, it's quite miraculous that we went from being enemies to being friends in only, in only 25 years. Um, and there were people who took great risks. What I gradually realized as, uh, as a student of Vietnam, or someone was really interested in Vietnam, is there was no way to move forward if you weren't honest about the past. And I, so I concluded, and I've, I've, I've kind of seen this in, in other situations around the world, so I don't think this is limited to Vietnam, but if you're not honest about the past, it's really hard to move forward and create a different kind of future. And in the early years, we were having a really tough time being honest about the past. Uh, I think from the beginning of the relationship, when I first got started and worked for Pete Peterson and Desai Anderson before him, we were completely focused on American MIAs. That was the uh, political obsession in the United States with regard to Vietnam. And it was very important to find a way to collaborate on those whom America had lost uh, during the war in order to create political space for engagement in other areas. Once we had built a little bit of trust in that region, and it was clear to the United States that Vietnam was being incredibly helpful on you know, finding those Americans who'd been lost, then we started collaborating, and you mentioned this, unexploded ordnance at cleaning up unexploded ordnance. And this really started with an announcement during uh, Bill Clinton's visit. Uh, and at, just at the end of his, his term as president in 2000, just, bef just before he left office, uh, he went to Vietnam and he announced that we're gonna 
work together on cleaning unexploded ordnance. And we started doing that and we did it kind of slowly, um, but it, we picked up momentum over time. At that time, in those early years, no one wanted to talk about Agent Orange. No one wanted to talk about Baxin. I, um, as Brian mentioned, I was the regional environment officer. I was focused on environment science and technology cooperation. And so I, worked, I went to the first US-Vietnam Joint Commission on Science and Technology. And I was told, do not discuss dioxin. Don't use the words Agent Orange or dioxin in, in an official conversation. Now, why was this? It was kind of a political third rail. Um, we had a rough, there'd been a rough time in the United States coming to grips with the effects of, of dioxin on American on American soldiers, on people who'd gone to Vietnam and been exposed to DACs in there. Um, and I don't think the US government wanted to deal with its culpability. It's, it's uh, the fact that we were responsible for the, for the fact that people in Vietnam were being affected by, by dioxin. Now, I should be clear about what dioxin is. When you manufacture Agent Orange, a uh, defoliant that was used during the war to to um, wipe out forests so that Americans could find their enemies. Um, the, the, there's a byproduct, a highly toxic byproduct called dioxin, and it lasts a long time. Its toxicity uh, lasts a long, long time. And it turns out, we've learned this over the years, that uh, when a human being ingests dioxin, it it actually passes on to the next generation and to the next generation and to the next generation. So it's horrible. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's actually, it's hard to talk about in an emotionless way. It's a very, uh, the impact on people is very profound. Um, and it was uh, literally the hardest thing I had to deal with uh, as ambassador, especially in dealing with my own government, because there was still so much resistance to taking uh, full responsibility for, for what we'd left behind in Vietnam. But early on, there were a few key people who took really great risks, to be honest. And I would cite a few on the American side and a few on the Vietnamese side who really, really made a difference. They just said, hey, wait a minute, we're not going to lie about this. We're going to go, we're going to be honest about this. Um, my friend uh, Charles Bailey, um, who uh, spent many years, has continues actually to, to spend time on vaccine. He, when he was the head of the, the Ford Foundation in Vietnam, he commissioned a study to kind of narrow down the, the scope of the problem, figure out, you know, where is this vaccine everywhere? And, he, and, and when he uh, commissioned this study, he, he learned, and we all learned, that there were a few key hotspots, really three major hotspots, where there was still a lot of dioxin uh, left over. Now, this is actually kind of good news because it meant there wasn't dioxin everywhere. It wasn't in the crops all over the country. It wasn't that everybody was still exposed to it, uh, but there were a few key hotspots, and that meant if there are a few key places where it was concentrated, it could be cleaned up. And he worked with uh, people like Senator Leahy, who you mentioned, and uh, our good friend, Tim Reeser, and you, Tao, because you were involved in this, in this story. Um, and then, and he worked with people, uh, Vietnamese officials. Uh, his his co-author um, of uh, From Enemies to Partners is Dr. Le Ke Sun. And there was a, a woman named Dr. Fung who was part of the US Vietnam Agent Orange Dioxin Dialogue. Um, my good friend, uh, wonderful diplomat, Madam Ton Nu Thi Ninh, um, Bui Te Zhang. Um, they, they worked together to kind of figure out what are, the, what are some of the ways forward uh, to deal with this challenge. Um, and then, so by the time I got to Vietnam, a lot of steps had been taken. Uh, there was, had been a great deal of progress made on cleaning up the second biggest hot, hot spot in Da Nang. And by then, Phu Cot had been sort of uh, covered over. So there were really two big hot spots left, Da Nang and uh, Bien Hoa, uh, which was even a bigger hot spot than, than Da Nang. 
And I was interested, you know, as any ambassador would be, I was interested in developing a security relationship with Vietnam. But I worked really closely with um, Lieutenant, he was then Lieutenant General uh, Nguyen Chi Vinh uh, at the, the Ministry of Defense. And there was not a single meeting that we had where we didn't at some point touch on the topic of the accident. And so I began to realize I need to keep conveying to those who want a security partnership in the United States, we have to deal honestly with this problem. If we want the kind of security relationship that we envision and that I thought Vietnam also would welcome, we needed to be honest. And it was, I have to say it was hard. We went through the process of cleaning up Da Nang and I was really proud when we got to the end of, I think it was the first tranche and I was able to put my hands in the dirt and show the world this is safe. And I have two little children. I would not have held the dirt that had been cleaned of dioxin if it hadn't been safe, but I knew it was safe. The remediation efforts that we'd made had worked and this soil and the water around were, were clean of dioxin. But there was still this big, this big uh, repository of dioxin near what the former air, airfield in Bienhua. And um, that was really one of the hardest things that I had to deal with because it was quite expensive to clean it up. And I had to convince people in the United States, we have to finish the job. And they didn't want to spend the many, many, the hundreds of millions of dollars that it would take to completely clean it up. But I'll tell you just a quick story to illustrate how important this was. Um, I went to Bienhua a number of times, but one of the times I went to Bienhua and I, I saw General Vin there and we talked about uh, remediation efforts. Um, I went down this little creek that ran from the Bienhua airfield down into a river. And I could see that people were eating fish. They were catching fish and eating fish out of this river and, and out of this creek where dioxin was flowing from the airfield into the river. And there were 75 families who had homes along this, this creek. And there were children playing in the mud, playing in the creek. And they were being exposed to dioxin. There were ducks mm -hmm. and fish that the, those families were eating. And those kids were being exposed. And now think about it. Once the dioxin gets in the human body from whether it's from eating a duck or a fish or whatever, it is in that person forever. And it is in that person's children, children's children, and children's children's children. So those kids, and they were the age of my kids, those kids were condemned because we had been slow to be honest and to take responsibility for the past. This to me was very, uh, was hard to bear uh, because I feel like I represented the United States and we were responsible. And I did everything to convey this to, to the government. And I was, uh, really, really stubborn. They told us to shut up, stop talking about it. The money wasn't going to come forward and I wouldn't, and my team wouldn't. And we were relentless and we kept going after the defense department, USAID, the state department saying we have to finish the job. And it really, it was really Tim Reeser and Senator Leahy who were just as stubborn and maybe more stubborn and wouldn't let go, who finally were able to get the funds just as we had proposed, half the funds from USAID, half the funds from Department of Defense to finish the job and clean up Bienhua. So I'm glad it is now being cleaned up. There won't be more children exposed to Dax in there. I'm just sad it took so long. Thank you, Ted. Thank you very much for your effort. Um, throughout what you sh shared just now, I hear a couple of keywords, liability, responsibilities, profound impact, children, you know, affected by exposure to uh, these uh, dioxin contaminated areas. And I remember I read, um, you know, you also mentioned the role of Charles Bailey and his organization at the time, the Ford Foundation. And one of the wonderful things that he did was 
he was able to develop a vocabulary that the officials, yeah. the both US government and Vietnamese government could use without being overly sensitive. And that yes. was really key in the early days when the issue was so, so sensitive. Now, my question yeah. to you is, as of today, even we have made so much effort, so much progress, but it seems to me that there's still a difference in terminology or vocabulary, and one in particular. Um, if you read the Vietnamese media, you being able to, to read Vietnamese, it would, it would see that Vietnamese use the term uh, Asian Orange victims. But you will never find the word victims in the English speaking um, document, and particularly those from the US. So do you think that we could reconcile that? Or do we think we need to reconcile that terminology? So it will take continued persistence and stubbornness. I find with a problem that's as thorny as this, the only way to go is not to be willing to give up. But Charles was not about to give up, even when he encountered a lot of resistance from the US government. Um, uh, Charles was, you know, he didn't represent the US government, so he could do what he thought was right and what the Ford Foundation thought was right. But I can tell you, he was, his work was not welcomed um, by the United States government. It was resisted. And um, it was only when uh, Michael Marine, the third, uh, the third US ambassador to Vietnam, uh, said, we've got to deal with this honestly and communicated with Senator Leahy and others and started and eventually was able to persuade President Bush to George W. Bush to say, um, we're, going, we're going to commit to cleaning up the accent. It was only after really stubbornness and persistence that they were able to, to change the dialogue and um, move the United States toward a position where it would accept responsibility. Um, I agree that we're not yet there when it comes to those who suffer, continue to suffer from the effects of Asian Orange in Vietnam. Um, we, the, uh, Charles, in fact, showed a film, an uh, Academy Award nominated film called Cho Beyond the Lines. He showed it on Capitol Hill, which I thought was uh, really great. It was, it's, a, it's a very inspiring film in my view, because it's about someone who's not a victim. He's a, he, he suffers the effects of, of Dax and of Agent Orange, um, but he's an artist and he has, his life is tough, but he, he, he strives on. So it's a, it shows, it's so human. He's so charming and, wi and winning that you, you don't really look at him as a victim, but you also look at what, what Agent Orange has done to him and how it has curtailed his life. And I, of course, visited a lot of uh, people in hospitals who suffered the effects of Agent Orange. Uh, Senator Leahy was the first official to go and uh, call on families who had uh, family members who suffered from the effects of Agent Orange. We have to keep bringing attention to it um, because yes. if we, we, we can't let up. And listen, Senator Leahy is going to retire. He's announced that he is, is going to retire. So others need to become the champions and to pick up the baton and be just as stubborn as Charles was and Senator Leahy was and Tim Reeser was when it comes to dealing with uh, the US government. You, you, the, the, the attitude has to be, we will not give up until the right things are done. And it's gonna take per continued uh, persistent effort to get us to take full responsibility for what has happened. I hope that we can deal with more questions related to, you know, the question, um, the topic you just raised that who are we going to find as champions for these issues, uh, not only from the US side, but also from the Vietnamese side. Yeah. Remember when you worked in Vietnam, you were very affected because you have a wonderful partner being to Nguyen, yes. who served as the deputy minister of defense for 12 years. Yeah. That really yeah. helped to, to, to create the change consistently. Absolutely. So who's next for us from both sides? Um, due to time constraint, I'm going to now shift to uh, the next question about the Red uh, the uh, Mekong River. And, uh, in and I the would book, note, Pat, just to yes. correct the record, so 
you, I know you love the Mekong, but you're from Hazan, which is up near the border of China. I, I wrote a little bit in chapter five about, about Tao and because there's a whole generation of people who've been, were born since the war, maybe affected by what happened uh, mm -hmm. during the war, but weren't actually alive during the war. Tao, I think mm -hmm. you were born in 1976. Um, 78. 78, sorry. Uh, and so after the war was over, affected by the war, but not, your lives weren't determined. The, your generation, your lives were not determined or, uh, by the war, they, but they were affected uh, by the war. Anyway. Uh, and I, I did. I have to correct my own introduction. Um, I misread that Hazang as as Haozang. Um, ah, <laughs> no worries, no worries. But I've been. Um, I, uh, Tao has told me the stories about traveling to Hazang, and I've I've biked with her uh, all over the place, and I've been to Hazang. So I just wanted to. Uh, yeah, I wanted I wanted to be uh, clear about that ge geography, but Mekong. Uh, Mekong is important to everyone who lives in Vietnam, whether you're from Hazang or from Kianzang. It doesn't matter. In, in my line of work, uh, which just came to an end recently, I see uh, the Mekong challenges is the most important issues for Vietnam to deal with uh, because, you know, of its strategic location, the economic dynamic, um, and the water resources management, and not just Vietnam, but also other countries in the sub region of Mekong. So my questions to you is, um, how did you first get involved and interested in the Mekong issues? Well, just as a, a diplomat working in Southeast Asia, I visited a lot of places along the Mekong. Uh, I went to uh, Vientiane, I went to Phnom Penh, um, I went to, uh, a wonderful uh, place called a thousand island referred to as a thousand mm. islands the mm. cone falls and i saw a pod of of mekong dolphins um they're they're uh white and kind of small freshwater brackish water dolphins and i became fascinated by the fact that these dolphins were the last of a kind there were some they're irrawaddy dolphins that are related to the mekong dolphins probably their cousins um, and, but, I, but the fact that these dolphins were going to become extinct and had been around for millennia since the Holocene era um, was very troubling to me. And I got interested in the Mekong catfish. It's a 600 pound fish, enormous freshwater fish, uh, also um, near extinction, unfortunately. And so I, I kind of fell in love with the river and the life along the river. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, found it, I found the river to be magical and beautiful. And um, people's lives, they're very, very interesting. Luang Prabang is a, is a truly magical place in Laos, right on the Mekong, um, where monks come out in the morning. <laughs> they have their begging bowls. They've been doing this for probably for millennia. They come and, and people put rice into the begging bowls and the, the, the monks, and I had a chance to talk with a lot of the monks, um, they're, this is how they learn. This is how they go to school uh, in that. A lot of people go to school that way by going to the monastery uh, for a period of time. And I found the Mekong just magical and I loved it. And then, as Brian mentioned, I became the the environment officer, regional environment officer for Southeast Asia. And I suddenly realized there's a diplomatic issue here that's re a really important. Vietnam is at the bottom of the river. Um, yes. And the relations with the countries that are upstream are very important because decisions that are made upstream affect Vietnam the most, affect those who are downstream the most. They certainly affect Cambodia too. The, the, the whole uh, system that supports, that supports uh, the Tonle Sap, which is really central to Cambodia and, and uh, the Mekong and the Tonle Sap provide a huge percentage of the, of the protein that the people of Cambodia uh, survive on. Um, this is all affected by decisions that are being made about the Mekong, decisions about damming, decisions about dredging, decisions about fishing, 
all uh, affect those who are downstream. And there was not much of a system in place to make sure that downstream interests uh, were being heard by those upstream. And so when I started working on the Mekong issues more than 20 years ago, um, I brought them to the attention to very senior people at the State Department. And I said, you know, this is a really fundamental problem for about 250 million people. And we, we have to care about this. And eventually those concerns turned into the Lower Mekong Initiative and yes. uh, to a structure, a diplomatic structure yes. around dealing with the challenges of this very, very important river. Um, and I, I think of it as the second front. I think there are yeah. two big fronts for ASEAN countries in yes. dealing with their northern neighbor. One is, is the South China Sea or the Bien Dong, the East Sea for the Vietnamese and the yes. set of islands that are disputed, the decisions about freedom of navigation, about fishing, uh, about the issues of, of Bien Dong. Um, yes. And then the, but the second front, in my view, is the Mekong. And decisions yeah. that are being made about the Mekong, particularly by, by China, but also by Laos and Thailand. Yes. Yes. Um, and I was really happy to see there's an announcement just came out about Secretary Blinken's travel to the region and they talk about the Mekong. So yep. this is not no longer just something that scientists are thinking about. And then a, you know, oh. a few stray diplomats are thinking about. This is something that is at the top of the diplomatic agenda. And I'm glad that it's there because I think it's existential. I love the way you talk about the Mekong River, like a, a, a human, you know, like you fall in love with the river, it's magical. Um, it so after 30 years of serving as a diplomat and then you uh, continue to stay in the region uh, and work from Singapore. So I like to get your perspective as an observer um, particularly in 2020, Vietnam served as the chair of ASEAN. So what do you think um, about the efforts by the government of Vietnam in pushing the Mekong-related issues to the agenda of ASEAN? Well, I think it's very smart. Look, no, I've watched Vietnamese diplomats over a long period of time, and uh, I've watched how very effective Vietnamese diplomacy has become over the past 30 years. So when Vietnam first joined ASEAN now what 30 years ago, um, I don't think it was as, eff as effective in pushing critical agenda items as it is now. Uh, Vietnam does its work very often without a lot of fanfare, without a mm -hmm. lot of headlines. Mm -hmm. um, any smart Vietnamese leader, and you don't get to the high levels without being very smart, knows that you have to balance relations with China with Vietnam's fundamental interests. And getting along with China is important. China has the ability to, to inflict great pain on Vietnam as it has shown in the past. And so working, you know, being sure to sort of modulate your efforts so they don't, they're not inc incredibly provocative to China is just smart. Uh, so, so Vietnam has moved at a considered pace to, to push issues like the uh, resolution of challenges in Bien Dong and South China Sea and issues in the Mekong yeah. steadily, uh, not, you know, not with a, sort of a huge amount of noise, but steadily and consistently and over time. And, Look, I, you know, I work with all ASEAN nations, but it's really st struck me how uh, strategic the thinking is of Vietnamese leadership and Vietnamese diplomats in particular uh, to, uh, about dealing with these issues. And the Vietnamese know that you need partnerships. To be able to deal with a country like China, it really helps yeah. to do it, not to be alone. If you go, yeah. as you know, happened during millennia past, as a vassal state, you mm -hmm. go to Beijing and bow and pay pay tribute. You're not going to mm -hmm. get much. But if mm -hmm. you if you go in partnership with other countries, you have a chance to to change the way the 
the Chinese think about an issue, to think the Chinese will have to think about the costs of bullying behavior in the South China Sea, or the costs of sort of rapacious action along the Mekong, or just damming up the whole river without any consultation with the downstream countries. Um, and I think, so I think having a diplomatic structure like the Lower Mekong Initiative or now the, the Mekong Partnership, um, that's, that's very important. And it means Vietnam's not alone in dealing with first front or the second front. Yes, I, I agree with you. Um, it, the, the effort by Vietnam is significant. However, it's just too bad that it happened the year when COVID took place. Yeah. So it, it really reduced the impact that we wished to have. Um, but it re, I, I see that the collaboration between US and Vietnam or US uh, with the Mekong sub-region countries uh, helped to promote or build a strategic partnership between US and Vietnam in the near future. That's yes. how I see it. And from Vietnam perspective, the more we work on the Mekong River issues, the more we could contribute to building a cohesiveness, you know, the sense of cohesiveness and responsiveness um, in the community of ASEAN. So is, with that, let me... Know, well, just yes? one little addition. It's not, yes? um, in the United States, it's not a democratic issue or Republican issue. The Assistant Secretary of, of State under... Donald Trump was also forceful in uh, seeking to deal with Mekong issues. So um, I think it's, it's heartening that the United States uh, has over time become more and more committed to being a partner on dealing with the challenges of the Mekong, as well as the challenges in the South China Sea of the Bien Dong. Mm, mm. Thank you, thank you. Now we're gonna go into the Q&A questions. I see a lot of questions coming in. So with the privilege of a moderator, let me pick the first question. And that is to ask you that, how can we replicate the, the excellent experience of US Vietnam efforts dealing with Asian Orange issues to expand it to US and Laos? Because Laos was also affected, still is infected by the spraying of dioxin, Asian Orange during the wartime. Uh, by this spraying of dioxin and also um, by unexploded ordnance. Uh, yes. There's been a lot of effort made to clean up unexploded ordnance and not so much uh, to clean up dioxin. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was George Black who wrote a really good article in the New York Times about the kind of forgotten uh, challenges of Laos. Well, they're not forgotten by everybody. Um, and the, uh, I mean, the, the Truth is we should be doing in Laos what we've been doing in Vietnam. Um, when I, uh, I, and I used to team up with, when, when she was ambassador to Laos, Rena Bitter, we would work together on these, try to persuade Washington to, uh, to make good decisions about war legacy issues um, and about deportation issues involving deportations. Um, so I, I believe that, you know, Laos is, our, our, our responsibilities extend uh, even to a place we claimed we, you know, Nixon claimed we weren't waging war in Laos, but we were, and the evidence still remains. The dioxin is still there, and the unexploded ordinance is still there, and we need to deal with the, the past honestly. Thank you. I agree. I can't agree with you more. We, we definitely need to do something with Laos. I mean, from the U.S. and also from Vietnam, we can share our experience. Definitely, lesson learned, the success and failure. Now the next question is about the Mekong River. China is controlling upper stream of the Mekong River and making some bad impacts on other countries such as Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. How is the role of the United States to encourage China's behavior to favor other countries? And it is from Tang Nguyen. When I was ambassador, Tom Shannon was the counselor of the State Department. And he used to go, even when it, uh, the, the Friends of the Lower Mekong um, would meet in Pakse, which is not a place mm -hmm. that high level diplomats necessarily go on a regular basis. He would go and he would, mm -hmm. he, and he explained to me that he was continuing to push a diplomatic framework 
for, uh, for uh, addressing the challenges of the riparian countries and the inability sometimes to get the Chinese to be responsive to their needs. It's that work starts based on sound science. You can only do that work if you have really good, accurate information. Look, er, in my book, sort of everything I wrote about the Mekong um, uh, comes from what I learned from Brian. Um, the, uh, he wrote a wonderful book called Last Days of the Mighty Mekong and the Stimson Center. Yes, it's a wonderful book. I, uh, I encourage people to read it. Um, and also, they do a Mekong monitor and my former company, Google, uh, provided some, some help. What that has done is it's made what's happening on the Mekong transparent. It was a lot easier for the Chinese when it wasn't transparent and they would just you know, open up the dams and let water rush through or close the dams and not tell the downstream neighbors what they were doing. I mean, this, their behavior contributed to some terrible droughts. Even when I was uh, am, ambassador, there was a terrible drought uh, in, uh, in the Vietnamese portion of the Mekong and uh, the, the Mekong Delta. And it, you know, it affected the livelihoods of millions. There are 20 million people who depend on, who depend on agriculture in the, in the Mekong Delta, at least 20 million and not just the 20 million who depend on it directly, but it, this, this affected food supplies all over the world because other countries rely on uh, Vietnamese rice exports. And mm. the, the decisions that were being made upstream had devastating impact mm. on uh, Vietnam's Delta. Uh, so transparency is essential, good diplomacy, leverage wherever it exists, naming and shaming, that could be part of it. Uh, and, and just making it costly for, for bad decisions to be made by the upstream nations. You need to have some leverage to be able to force good behavior. Well, I'm glad to see the French of the Mekong mechanism is at work. Yeah. yeah. Now, we have many questions coming and we have only 12 minutes left. Uh -oh. You know, five minutes of that is for conclusion by, by Brian. So you, you make a decision, either you give a wonderful stories um, to a few questions or short answers for many questions. Oh, okay. okay, I'll try I'm gonna story answers. Okay, oh. so I'm gonna shoot it along your, your way. Okay, so good. this question from John McAuliffe, and he asked, why are the earlier stages of concern about Asian Orange not often organized? You know, particularly, you know, we all know about the efforts by Dr. Tong Tat Tung uh, back yeah. in the early yeah, 80s. Um, and yet, you know, these days when we talk about that, it doesn't come into the, the documentation, the reporting, the stories. Yeah, there, there's a long answer and I'll try to give a short one. We hadn't normalized relations. Uh, we didn't normalize relations during the Carter administration. Opportunities were missed some very major opportunities were missed. And decisions, bad decisions, I think, were made on, on both sides. Um, uh, Vietnam's uh, invasion of Cambodia slowed down the process of normalization. Uh, decisions that were made on the US side to kind of move forward with normalization of relations with China ahead of Vietnam. Um, a, a number of decisions were made that made it very hard uh, to be honest about the past during that immediate uh, period after, after, the, uh, after the war. So we, there were all kinds of uh, issues that got swept under the rug during that period, not just Agent Orange. And I think it was to the detriment of both countries. It was a shame. I, I write about that in the book because I feel like there were uh, you know, attempts by Richard Holbrook and others to move forward in the relationship and they were stymied. Uh, and I regret that. And I want to add a bit, and it is to answer John McAuliffe, a uh, dear friend. Um, yes, I, I hear you, and I think it's important to correct that. And uh, at the moment, there is a team of experts working on telling the stories, the journey of how the issues of Asian Orange and Dioxin started, you know, I mean, the efforts of reconciliation, and it, it would start from back in the eight early 80s when Dr. Tung Tat Tung started. And um, I hope that the efforts of this group of experts, um, uh, we will see the outcome by the end of uh, next year. 
you know, just in time when we can celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Paris Peace Agreement. Okay. Now, uh, next question is from Lauren Hershey. That OCS, please comment on the prospective role of public diplomacy, like the Fulbright program, which Tao benefited from. So this, again, I'll try to make it short, but there's so much in this question. Um, the huge, huge benefit from the Fulbright program, the initial Fulbright program, and then the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program, and now Fulbright University, has had an enormous impact on US-Vietnam relations, not only by uh, educating people like Tao, and at one point, you know, several members of the Politburo, um, but by just helping our two countries understand each other better. Whenever you open the aperture and you have more students going back and forth and more business people going back and forth, more tourists, more family members, you learn about each other and you're not so mysterious and the process of reconciliation becomes possible. It's not just about governments, it's about human beings. Uh, so no, governments normalize, you know, based on the stroke of the pen, um, but societies, reconcile person by person, story by story. And what, what you know, the Fulbright program and other educational exchange programs have done is, is multiply that number of stories by thousands and thousands. So Tao learned uh, so much about the United States when she came uh, to the US on a Fulbright scholarship and it changed her life. And I think it changed the lives of many, many people, some of whom I write about in my book. Thank you. Now, next question from Phó Hồng Phong. Can the U.S. be an honest broker on Mekong issues, given its history with the Colorado? Go so, ahead. When I was a long ago, when I was environment officer, uh, I tried to partner the Mekong River Commission with the Mississippi River Commission. I think okay. it was probably a lot more effective there are more less lessons that could be learned from the Mississippi River Commission and from the Army Corps of Engineers um, for the Mekong River Commission. And I, I don't know too much about the Colorado River, but I did learn a lot about what the Mississippi River Commission could teach uh, to the folks who are, are working with, on Mekong issues. Um, I felt it was very important that we, we find counterparts. And this is a little bit of a diversion but um, when there was a, a, a consortium set up to deal with the challenges of Halong Bay, we managed to pair them with the, che the Chesapeake Bay Consortium, the consortium that had uh, cleaned up the Chesapeake Bay because it was multiple jurisdictions working on the same set of environmental problems. And um, the, the Halong Bay Consortium has been a private public partnership that I think has had some uh, some, some real impact on a, a wonderful place. Partnership with the, the Mississippi River Commission is the one that, that I focused on in those early years uh, because I, I hoped, believed uh, it would be effective. Brian would know uh, better than I whether it was. I give you two more questions and I, I hand over to, to Brian, okay? Now, the question, this question from Richard, Hi, Ted, I'm very moved by your story and can't wait to get and read your book and learn about your life and work in Vietnam and the Mekong. Can you say a little of how you engaged with the Vietnamese government to promote awareness of the Mekong issue and how difficult it was? Well, it wasn't difficult. Um, I found engaging on Mekong issues was actually quite easy because we were talking with the Vietnamese about something that mattered to them very much. So we worked with the uh, Ministry of of uh, science, Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources, and the foreign ministry um, on water challenges in the Mekong and on the science of, of the Mekong and on the diplomacies surrounding the Mekong. And Le Huai Trung, for example, I, I spoke with him often uh, about the challenges of the Mekong. He was actively engaged. He's now, uh, he's moved up, he's now uh, chairman of the External Relations Commission of the party. At the time, he was, a, he was vice minister of foreign affairs, but very much engaged uh, on the Mekong. Um, and uh, the, we, we, the, we had an, a, a basis for this work because we were providing 
uh, scientific, we were sharing information, scientific expertise with our counterparts in the Vietnamese government. Um, we, all, of these, all of these challenges had to be addressed by first looking at sound science uh, and, and <laughs> seeking science-based decision-making. And um, we had vibrant s and uh, relationship really since almost the beginning of the normalization period. So I'd say 25 years of a really good s and relationship and then at least 20 years of a, of a good relationship on public health. Uh, a very vibrant, very important relationship uh, between our two countries on public health. Thank you. The last question. Hello, Ted, Patrick Griffiths here. Can you try to project lessons learned into the current and forthcoming challenges for future world legacy issues in the obvious places? So no, I, I think, uh, Patrick, this is about looking sort of to the world, looking at Afghanistan, looking at where we've had uh, challenges the world over and what lessons we might learn that could be carried into some of those places. Um, I, I wrote my book about Vietnam because I know something about the history and the culture and the language and the people. And I, I, don't, I don't believe that those lessons can be taken you know, uh, wholly into other situations. The situation in Afghanistan, for, for example, is very different. Um, the, the society is different, but I think there are a few lessons we can still learn. We can still draw from what we learned in Vietnam. Um, the United States isn't that good at nation building. Uh, I would say probably no one is all that good at building nation outside of building nations outside of their own nations. Those who are on this, who can say, well, I'm the one who's speaking for my country tend to win the argument. Ho Chi Minh, in my view, Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist above all. And, and when he took, had the position of, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of the Vietnamese people, well, then we kind of had lost because we weren't, we were foreigners in, in Vietnam and uh, trying to build a nation, I think good intent, but we weren't successful because it wasn't our nation. And I think we have seen that happen in, in Afghanistan as well. And in other places where we've tried to build nations and the nationalists tend to win the argument because we're foreign uh, and we're you know, coming in maybe trying to impose our values on another people. Well, only when we're welcomed in um, and when our ideas and values are welcomed in, are we gonna be effective? When we're forcing them on other people, they tend not to be effective. And that I think is a pretty universal lesson. And just the other one briefly, I know we're uh, at almost at time, is it takes time to build trust. Uh, it's, a, it's a human process. I think what Tim Reeser said and Tao quoted earlier is right. It's about relationships and building trust. You build trust and you, you show respect and then you can build partnership and do things together. And that I think is a universal lesson. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Ang Ted. Um... It, it has been a real honor and pleasure for me as a my friend. You. And Tao, uh, as a love award, and, uh, it's my, my pleasure to talk with you, my friend. Yes, and I really look forward to welcoming you back in your Thank new position you. as I'm the president coming. I'm coming to of the U.S. and Business Council. Brian, are you there? Over to you. And thank, thank you, you very much for the honor. Thank you. And thank you, Tao. Thank you, Ted. I cannot think of two better people to be paired to discuss war legacies issues and the Mekong in one hour. And um, we, we learned so much. Um, I, just a quick question for Ted before I get to the concluding remarks. Ted, you've got a great book. Um, it's out for sale. Uh, what's the best way to, uh, to get a copy and maybe even get a signed copy of your book? Oh, for sure. Uh, it, it, you can get it in bookstores. You can order it on Amazon. You can order it from Rutgers University Press. There are uh, thrift books, um, independent bookstores. It's, it, at this point, it should be available pretty much anywhere in the world <coughs> by just going online. Go to your favorite book site. Uh, but if, if not, um, go to Rutgers University Press and Google OCS, and um, you, can always, you can always get it directly from the source that way. And if you want a, uh, it's easier for me to send a book plate than a signed book. 
Um, this is just the nature of COVID. I can't do as many in-person signings, but book plate is great because it's, it's, it looks nice. It's got the cover of the book and then I can sign it here. And anybody who sends me a mailing address and says, I bought the book, I'll sign a book plate, Bang Tiang An or Bang Tiang Viet, and I'll mail it, I'll mail it to you uh, just as a gift. Wonderful. So um, speaking of gifts, you know, I can't think of a better gift to um, give to a friend, a colleague, uh, than nothing is impossible. Um, a great story about the U.S.-Vietnam relationship and Ambassador Osius's journey within that story. We are at our hour of time. I'm going to avoid lengthy closing remarks to allow uh, Ambassador Osius and Tao to get back to uh, their jobs or their rest. Um, but again, on behalf of the Stimson Center, on behalf of our War Legacies Working Group, I want to thank you all for calling in. Thank you again, Ambassador Osius. Thank you again, Tao, for calling in from Hanoi. And thank you to our interpreter, Viet Dui. Uh, we had about, I think, 40% of our participants have Vietnamese names. I don't want to make any assumptions as how many were tuning into the Vietnamese language portal. Um, but again, um, thank you again. Happy holidays, everyone. And uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for this discussion, but thank you for the great work that you do at the Stimson Center, Brian and Tao. You continue to do for both of our nations. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm ordering 50 books for <laughs> all of you. 50. Oh, good advice. Oh, that's good advice. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you.